Hi, and welcome to another episode of Tom Ray's Art Podcast. I'm Tom. On today's show, I meet a fascinating person who's right now living in Canada, but finding out during the discussion, born and raised in Russia, moved to Canada, was going to move to the U.S., started a whole business, fashion designing business. Uh, it's I, I don't even know where to begin. We, we're talking and it's just, a fa- we get about, we get through the process of what this person has done and been through before we even start talking about the artwork that I wanted to talk to her about in the first place. It's a fascinating conversation. Great person. Uh, I really had a fun time talking with, with them and just, it was, it was, uh, it, it was, it was fun to do. It's, I, I love talking to all these people, but just, it's fascinating the things you learn talking to people and just what they've done, what they've been through, how it comes through in their artwork. Uh, she paints because it was a way to just get through an anxiety. And what I said there was, even I said it kind of anxiously. It's, it's a great conversation. Really had fun talking to this person. Was glad that I got to meet them. So here's my interview with Julia Hacker starting right now. Where are you located right now? Where do you live? I'm in Toronto, uh-huh. Canada. And, uh, well, I came here directly from uh, Belarus, uh, which is more known nowadays than before. Okay. Uh, I mean, everybody was uh, new Soviet Union and Russia. So I came in uh, 1990. Uh, in 1990? 19, in 1990, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and, and just you just decided to come here? Or was there a reason for you traveling uh, here? You know, for many years, I thought that uh, I did it for my kid because, like, it was like, Okay, you you're doing something. You you're taking your kid for the better future. Yeah. And then you know, recently doing a lot of uh, soul searching things, I realized that uh, no, I did it for myself. I just was very adventurous. Yeah. It, it was perestroika, like uh, so the Soviet Union was falling apart. As uh-huh. Was known all my life, and this I had this opportunity to go to another country. And I thought, what the heck? Like, why not? Right? Like, and like, I just left my very well established and good, good paid job. Okay. And, but I thought, like, no, but I need adventure in my life. I need freedom. I need to experience. And uh, that's how I end up uh, in, in Toronto. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, and f- from that point, then. Ten years later, after uh, being in Toronto, I met my husband to be and uh, married a uh, man that third generation Canadian. Yeah, right. But it's always when when we speak, her, he says like, "Oh, I wish I could say that I took you from Russia." And you would be so <laughs> if you would be a little bit more thankful to everything I do, <laughs> instead of you doing it all on your own and being self sufficient. <laughs> right. 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 <laughs> What was the opportunity that you had coming here to, or coming here? I, I'm, all of a sudden, I'm talking like I'm in Toronto. Uh, what was the uh, yeah. opportunity you had uh, to go to Toronto, or did you just that's the place you chose? Like, what was the motivation to go there? No, no, no. Uh, oh my gosh! Actually, I was on the way to United States to uh, to a good friend of mine that uh, offered me a marriage. Oh, so. And me and my mother stopped here just to see her friends, like while we were away there. And I, I was quite open to to this friend of mine with his him, and uh, I said to him that uh, I'm not uh, I'm not interested in a marriage. But he said like, just come stay a few months and you'll see if it's uh, if, if it will work out between us. Mm-hmm. But then when we landed in Toronto and stayed here for a few months, not few months, for a month we stayed here. Okay. All of a sudden, these uh, friends of ours, they said, like, there is opportunity of working visa. And, uh, I, and they found me a lawyer and so on. And I thought, 
I would rather do it on my own, not against your promises, through like, uh, you know, I would feel bad, he has his hopes, I, I'm i not sure. So it was much better and more um, open, uh, like about, okay, I'm getting visa, I'm staying here, and if it's a fate, we'll yeah. be it. Well, guy never spoke to me again. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so apparently it wasn't fate. <laughs> it wasn't fate, yeah. Not even as a brand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, yes. man. Were you, did you, uh, did you start out doing artwork there? I know, so I've seen some of your bio and I know that there, it was, uh, you had mentioned that you were actually a fashion designer for a little while. Right. Well, I couldn't, uh, uh, and that's why I, I loved my job back in uh, Belarus. And uh, but um, what was the job find... in Belarus? So I was a fashion designer. You were okay. I didn't know if you started yeah, out that and... way. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have uh, I have masters in fashion design. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was a fashion designer, and I was. Uh, um, I was uh, working at our, like, uh, because at that time it was still Soviet Union. So mm -hmm. under the guidance of one, like, fashion center was, like, many factories that will produce uh, uh, garments. Okay. So uh, I was, like, B Belarus at that point was about probably 15 million people. So, but all fashion was, uh, design was developed in one place. Really? Okay. So, yeah. So it was like about uh, uh, 15, 20 people uh, working. Mm -hmm. And so we all, we all had like, I was working with uh, kids clothes and women clothes, but somebody would be working on, uh, on men clothes. Somebody would be working on uh, um, outdoor attire. Like, uh, okay. So... Uh, we all had our own line of clothes to be responsible, but I would do everything from nightgown to wedding uh, dress. Like, <laughs> so it was like wow, <laughs> right? And then uh, and then uh, those factories that do because it, it was for everybody. Like the produce had to be sold in our stores and uh, available for public. Okay. So uh, and. Uh, understanding of boutique store or designer label was not uh, done at that point. Mm -hmm. So, um, but be besides this job, I had, uh, I was running uh, a spread in a fashion magazine, like for teenagers and oh. like uh, doing like uh, what's fashionable this year, how, mm -hmm. how to make a piece of denim, how to rub it, how to uh, do uh, distress with it, and, yeah. and what, what kind of uh, uh, ideas you can do with this. And also, I was developing um, um, outfit, not outfits, but like uh, uh, stage costumes for opera singers, for pop singers. So I, I was like very busy. I loved what I did. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a joke when I'm saying I left a very cool uh, job, like job of my dream, like I and money were really good as well. So when I left it, it's not a joke of uh, I'm not embellishing it. Right. I left yeah. It great. Yes, it was very, very satisfactory. But um, at the same time, uh, living uh, with so much censorship, with uh, there is certain also <clears throat> in terms of relationship between uh, uh, men and women. Mm -hmm. uh, be, like there is, there is so many little and not so little triggers that tells you go. You have to experience the world. You have to experience different understanding how how world uh, works. You know, yeah. it's not only about like just money. Let's say or right. <clears throat> Uh, so, and uh, when I came to Canada and I said to myself, okay, it's like a clean slate. Nobody knows me here, right? I didn't have any friends. Mm -hmm. I just, like, my, my parents uh, had friends, but nobody knew me. And I said like, so I can be whatever I want to be. Like, 
no childhood luggage, right. nothing, right? And so, and not, I'm now, I'm not Julia, but I'm Julia. And it's somebody that nobody knows, and even I don't know myself yet. So <laughs> <laughs> let's leave. <laughs> <laughs> right. So what? Right. So what did you choose to uh, when when you decided that? I mean, that's uh-huh. that's a, a. I feel like that's an opportunity not a lot of us get. What was the uh, the sort of? I, I'm trying to think of the word, but like, what was the the path? I guess that you chose. What was the what was the change oh. that you decided to take over? Okay, uh, you know, <laughs> sometimes people do things because. Uh, it's courage, and sometimes because they're just stupid. Okay. <laughs> I don't. Know I like that quote. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, so when I came over, I uh, I went to um, to study English at the, and take took English as a second language, okay. obviously, to immerse myself. And then my first job. Was I was uh, at the coat check at the Pantages Theater, oh. and at that time they played Phantom of the Opera. Nice. And uh, but I knew that I need to immerse myself with English-speaking people. Like I somehow intuitively I knew I have to move away from Russian community because it's very uh, those communities and ethnic communities when you as an immigrant arrive to country to another country. Yeah. They hold you so strongly, like you can't even imagine like how everybody has an advice for you. Everybody has an advice how to take advantage of the system, how to like, how how to reap benefits. But they live in this like close-minded, like it just better material things around. Okay. All right, because in Russia, even you, if you had money, you couldn't really buy much. Like, let's say, I could never buy a car because it was not available. Like, mm-hmm. Not because I, not because I couldn't collect money for it, but I just, it was not available. But here, like, so, and somehow I knew I have to move on. I have to move move out from this uh, enclosed like community. A community uh, that was still thinking as if they were in Russia is, is kind of exactly. what you're saying. Okay. They, they keep, and uh, I look uh, so many years already. And when I meet people like, and they could be wonderful people, but I yeah. know people that would, would really succeed. It's people who are trying to reasonably assimilate who are not uh, because a lot of uh, Russian people like, at least at that time, or, or my generation and older, they would be. Uh, we're reading only Russian book, only Russian t- television. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, they live uh, to, and go to their own concerts because it's always like good concerts, of right? Russian. And uh, for me, I thought that okay, I came to another country to find out what is it all about, right? So mm-hmm. I would just. I take the subway, get out on uh, at the stop, and go for hours on the main street, just wandering around, looking around. Even when I didn't know one soul, like yeah. I still I wanted to wander and absorb and see how people behave, how they dressed, how uh, what's the interaction, what how do I hear English differently than at school. So um, I think that being a dreamer, like, kind of helped <laughs> yeah maybe i didn't realize like uh uh so uh, heavy things of course was it what was most difficult is i couldn't find a niche because even when i uh started working at the pantage theater because i was already older mm-hmm. i was like i was 30 years old and who is working at, uh, at the theater like uh Students, it's their part yeah. time, right? Most of the people, right? And until unless you're performing on the stage, right. <laughs> but so uh, I couldn't find. I didn't want to be um, like with my um, ethnic community, but I didn't want. But I could not find a way to uh, to observe myself, to assimilate myself in in English speaking and Canadian uh, community. Yeah. And uh, 
I realized that I'm very lonely. So while, while I was, and my, my kid at that point, because I had six years old kid, mm-hmm. uh, he wasn't with me because when I was living, I was living kind of on vacation. I didn't know that I'm going and going to stay. Like, so I was going for a few months. So um, I was very lonely and missing home and so on. So to distract myself, I started to just do drawings. I would put some uh, paper on the walls. I didn't have easel or whatever, like, mm-hmm. but I would put, and it was like very cool apartment, but uh, no table, just a little couch that I could open. Okay. And I would paint it on the floor or I would just staple stuff directly to the wall. And, uh, and I would start painting and it kind of distracted me. And, uh, that was helping me with, with my sanity. And uh, then eventually, and at the same time, I was looking for jobs as a fashion designer. But yeah. I could not find anything because really? I, was, I was overqualified. Oh, no. That's the I worst was, answer I, ever. I hate it was it. <laughs> so terrible. When you come to interview and they listen to you and they say, like, no, but you're overqualified because uh, in six months you will just like uh, uh, you'll leave us. That's what they say. That like, is what gonna... I know. I don't understand that answer. They're like, we're afraid you'll be bored here, and it's like, um, just pay me. <laughs> don't worry, I can do something like after work hours, not to be bored. And also, but... who do you think you're hiring? People who are going to be doing this for the rest of their lives? They're never going to want to advance. They're never going to want to do something else. Okay. Anyway, sorry. Yes, yes. I've I've heard that answer myself. I know what you mean. (laughs) You know what is it, right? Yeah. So silly. If I came here, then I have an interest to to do something in this field in in your store or whatever. Like those immigrants, they don't have so much money to to take it, and like they have to support families that they brought. So uh, that system is really uh, not not a smart one. Not right. uh, I'm yeah. Anyway. Yeah, now I'm a big. I know. I know. We we obviously have have a problem with that part. But yes, so you so you started looking for fashion jobs. Yes, back to that. Right. So yeah, uh, wasn't successful. Then uh, quite fast found the job as a uh, as a co check and Mm -hmm. usher in in the theaters, and they transferred me to. Uh, to boutique, uh, uh, to the boutique store, oh. to do sales. So, uh, and while I was doing that, I realized that uh, I really want to paint. And um, ah, and I also went to, like I applied to the Ministry of Education. I wanted to see if I can go and take some courses or some schooling. Oh, okay. And, but when I submitted all my documents and all my credentials from university from my previous university, right? Mm-hmm. They said they said you have equivalent of masters in fashion design here. Oh, like we don't, yeah. So they, they they said like I don't know where where you're gonna go. Like uh, wait, now when they a- when they say you have an equivalent of it, does that mean that they can transfer it over and you can like technically go? I have a master's in fashion design. Yes, okay, exactly. all right. I didn't I didn't know if they were saying like that's what yeah. this is, but we can't call it that because you didn't get it here. I, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, no, because they do. Uh, you supply. Uh, uh, you ask for transcript from your university. Okay. Then you do translation of it, and then they check. And let's say you have so many hours in uh, anatomy, or so many hours in color theory, okay. uh, or still life, or whatever painting or drawing. So when they see an amount of hours and the qualification of university where you came from, that's how they do equivalent. Uh, uh, okay. Whatever, whatever your level is. Okay. So yeah, I, ha- I have this paper where it says like y- your credential is equivalent of Canadian f- master design in fashion. Okay. So Ma- you masters in fashion design. So then, what so, did that mean? Were you not able? To, were you still able to take courses? Did you continue? Like, what happens after they tell you this? You know? <laughs> Zip tick. It means nothing <laughs> in real life. <laughs> okay. You can put it under the frame and like this. Here's a piece of artwork for you to hang up. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. It's just for me. Uh, I, uh, you know, I used it once in my life only when, uh, again, when we were courting with my husband and uh, yeah. he was like, uh, 
because he's he's a scholar he's very very smart guy and so on okay and like and one day like uh, and he's like oh i did uh, i'm going to do masters uh, in business he was planning to do masters in, in business and i said masters I already have masters. And he said, what do you mean? <laughs> so I had to pull out the paper, and he was like, "I think that's the moment when he decided to marry me." <laughs> <laughs> it was a breaking point. That's funny. Oh. So uh, anyway, it did nothing really. As I said, not, it did not help. But yeah, uh, my longing to be uh, immersed in in some schooling brought me to um, i started to take courses here at the art gallery of ontario they have very very good quality courses for adults yeah and in different media you can do drawing you can take sculpture painting whatever you want mm -hmm. so while i was doing that uh it kind of felt like okay this is one place where i feel belonging right when yeah. i speak the same language when uh people of different level but we're all like obsessed with what we're doing there we all have an you know, idea and um, so uh, that uh, kind of gave me uh, relief because uh, relief in terms of understanding finding my niche mm -hmm. that was first it, it happened in a year after I came here and it was first uh, glimpse that I can fit in, you know, because that year was quite difficult of not uh, belonging anywhere. Uh, and talking about belonging, it, it was also very interesting uh, to talk about, uh, to, to realize that, let's say, when I was uh, back in Belarus, in the former Soviet Union, mm -hmm. uh, I was always considered as a Jewish person because my father is Jewish, right? Okay. And it's even in my passport says that I'm Jewish and so on. So, uh, and uh, the result, uh, it, it was very like anti-Semitic little things that you could feel a lot. So you come in, and to, I came to Canada and I'm like, okay, I'm proudly Jewish. Let me feel how does it mean? Also, we never had any religious services it was not even allowed like right okay so um all of a sudden uh i go to to some shul like talk, talking to people and they tell me but you're not jewish your mother is not jewish so by jewish religion apparently if your mother is not jewish you're not jewish so if your mother I, isn't yes because jewish Judaism go by mother, okay, not by any parent, only by mother. Huh. Okay. Because, uh, well, historically, Jewish women were raped and like uh, whatever. So they, they, that's how they. It, it was not known who is the father of 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 kids. So that's how they established this tradition. Okay. Uh, but you understand also like all 30 years of your life you feel and uh you know that you're jewish even when you are not doing any like uh, religious things but mm -hmm. you know you're jewish you come in to another country and you've been told you're not and you don't know anything else and i remember one of the worst feelings of um, loneliness it's when it will be uh, Hanukkah and Christmas usually very close in December, they're both in December. Mm -hmm. So you go like, and let's see, on uh, Hanukkah, you see rows of cars and people celebrate it. You see like through the windows, people celebrate and family gathering. And you feel like you're alone. You, you don't have anybody because the com Jewish community didn't take me. Yeah. And uh, then in a week or so Christmas comes and again everybody celebrating singing songs yeah and I never knew those uh, celebrations so again you're alone and this is like sense of not belonging to anything it's like really it was very very disturbing in terms of your identity who, who are you who like so what are you who are you you know it was mm -hmm. very uh 
that that part was very challenging, I would say, through immigration. But you were able to find this sense of community with the with the like the art group that you discovered, the like art uh, for adults or. Uh, you know what? Not not fully, but I've got uh, friends with uh, with instructor. Uh-huh. And, uh, so so I started to communicate, but it was not like a. Uh, personal friends like relationships that i would go to her place she would go to my place okay yeah but it was still like at least i i could go like once a week and be with people there but it was still quite quite uh, difficult uh by that time my mother managed to bring my kid here so oh, okay he, he was six years old and he went to school so i've got i've got involved with uh between work and being a single mother. Yeah. And there I went again to Jewish community and I said like, guys, that's all I know, like help me out here. And so um, they helped me to place him in a, in a, in, in a Jewish school. Mm-hmm. So, but what's happened in a Jewish school, they spoke French, Hebrew and English. Poor kid, six years old, spoke only Russian. Right. He was not. I was going to ask that. I'm like, did he speak yeah. any other language? Yeah. No, no. And okay. he was lost. And he was like, a, and he was chased. And he couldn't like, so it was so freaking like ter- terrible. Like those couple of <laughs> years. Yeah. Just to say it's off, right? And then uh, I remember one day uh, I came to the school and like I'm saying to teacher, uh, how can I help him? Like at home, maybe I should take some course for him. Like, no, like whatever. Yeah. And she says to me, you don't speak Hebrew yourself. Like, how are you going to help? Like, and apparently I was giving him sandwiches and what's the best sandwich? Meat and cheese, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Good sandwich. Not a bad sandwich. And, the, <laughs> uh, and they will take the sandwich and throw it away. Oh, no. And for six for six months, I couldn't hear would come and cry and say, like, they took away his food and teachers threw it in the garbage. And, like... Wait, I the was teacher like, was doing this? Yes, teacher, teacher. I thought you were saying, like, some dumb kids were doing it. Apparently, like, a few months later, I found, when I went, and uh, because I didn't believe him, and when I talked to her, and she said, but your uh, sandwiches are not kosher. Oh, and okay. I got gotcha. you. What kind of Jewish person I was, I didn't even know what's kosher. Right. Okay. So because we were not really, like, it was a mess. It was a mess. So, but what was a kind of sanity that I was painting a little bit by little bit, I was painting. Yeah. And uh, then uh, for a while I was bringing, I left the Pantages City and I started a business. I was bringing students from, Russia to study in to study English in the university. Oh, yeah. like the, so I was do, dealing with this. Like I was a mama for like all of a sudden fifteen kids. Like ages you were, between. Eight, you 18. were filling. Yeah, you were filling the gap that was there when you first came over because these people exactly. would come over and you were. Oh yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, that that was really good. To, good. Like I mean. Uh, uh, be, being with people that want want communication and like and studying and like that was a good part. That was a, quite a good business until uh, uh, Russians discover ways to send their kids to much closer places like mm. England and Switzerland and so on. So, but for a for few years there, I was like uh, feeding my family from this. Okay, um, and uh, then. I decided to open uh, a little uh, store that I would be making clothes, making my own designer line. Okay. I, by this time, I found like uh, people that could uh, do patterns and so on. And um, I also thought I would bring uh, some clothes from Italy, like because I was. In my soul, I was a fashion designer, so yeah. I was doing everything related to this. And what's uh, I remember how I went to Italy, 
uh, like this vocabulary, this dictionary, I've learned like how to count till 10 because I needed to bargain, right? Like, right. But my point is to bargain. <laughs> and then I think, how would I find anybody where they sell clothes, where they sell wholesale? So I went, I saw a modeling agency. Mm -hmm. And so I went to modeling agency and I said to myself, this is people who know where to get clothes right like modeling fashion design so and that's how they gave me a few connections few and uh for a while i was bringing uh, clothes from italy and like uh, that was wow the whole new game of fun and uh and uh it was my broken broken italian they called me like that i'm a surgeon because i was barking in so hard <laughs> like... <laughs> oh, that, that was fun um and by that time, I already, I, I met my husband to be, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, between the store, uh, running my own little collection, but what was very disappointing with uh, my own label, again, because my store was in Russian area, mm -hmm. what, what they would do, they would they love what we made, like uh, or the sewing process, the design, everything. But at the end, they would bring me a dress, all dress, where it would say like Versace or some designer, right? And they would say, put this label on the bag. Don't put your label. Oh. Because this is um, a status. Because everybody, if she goes to the restaurant, this woman, and says, oh, I bought Versace when I was in Paris. Everybody mm. knows that she bought a dress for a few thousand dollars, not for, let's say, a few hundred dollars. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's, uh, uh, this is so Russian. And this is, but for me, being inside the industry, like it's so overrated, all these like labels and brands and so on. Like I'm not mm -hmm. minimizing achievement, but in, in the financial, status way is this is right. just really really overrated. yeah i get what you mean yeah yes so and finally uh my husband said like uh how about we'll like figure out something and uh, he made me he proposed to me and he said like how about we will uh, uh like get rid of the store because it takes day and night from you and you will be doing what you love to do and uh, we, my, I was with my son, and we thought about making another baby. So I left everything and got pregnant and started to paint. And that's where I started to paint seriously. Like yeah, me, uh, every every day that I could have, I would paint. Right. Yeah. And. Um, of course, it took it took a couple years again before I, w I said to myself, "Okay, maybe I will start showing." Because uh, it, in spite of being introduced during the schooling uh, to uh, to fine art, you still like because in your head you were always fashion designer you were not an artist yeah and this imposter syndrome is really really i remember doing the resume and my friends telling me no no don't put it your fashion that you have masters in fashion design don't put nobody like because artists they cannot be fashion designer it's like so materialistic like, you have which to is be funny because i disagree i think it i think if any when i found out that you actually did do that previously and i looked back at your work i was like oh that explains like the motion in the things that you do or i would like to say you have a very uh I, what i would say steady hand like you have somewhere you've drawn uh or not drawn you painted letters and the letters are so perfect and just so it looks like you did it flawlessly and it's one of those things where like when i draw i'm like why does it look like i just had 10 cups of coffee and i can't draw a straight line you know <laughs> It's, and yours, yours is just so it's flowing and it's just, it just looks like you're taking your time, but at the same time, it's very thoughtful in the way that you're doing it. And it's, it's, it, you know, and I think that is part of the fashion design. It's the swooping motion. It's the shapes, it's the form. And I think and that's perfect. Of our, exactly. Of our previous uh, training, mm -hmm. uh, uh, like no matter what background people come into the art, I always find it very interesting to see how they bring the experience. Even I have a 
sometimes I uh, mentor adults. Like I have no patience for kids. Like I just like, <laughs> kids are like I'm like I'm not babysitting. I'm not saying this is good to make valid. It feel good. I get you. Yep. Right. So, uh, but I do work with uh, people who are like lawyers or doctors uh, because they don't want to go and start studying and be in a group. They value their time. They want like to have a very like good way. So I found that even when, let's say, uh, I was working with a surgeon and he, the details, the Mm-hmm. little things I cannot do this like and time he takes and he's so patient and he, there is no irritation for me I'm like ah, like if I have to do the small like little things I'm like okay where where is anything that calms me down like whatever like, right no coffee for, for three days yeah. so it's really uh very interesting and like today it's also to open my mind and understand that uh, uh, background only can influence you, but it doesn't make you better or worse in in uh, in, in uh, art. Yeah. Let's say, you know, it's it's totally uh, it it can help you. It can speed up things. But sometimes I found like uh, when uh, when again when I was dating with my husband. Uh, because it was night classes in in the winter, so I thought like, okay, I'm gonna give him present for birthday. That was a few months ago, but I needed that timing, mm-hmm. and we'll go to a sculpture class together. Oh. So, because at night we're coming back together, I'm not like so uncomfortable like to go late nights. And this guy never he's in financial industry never like painted or sculpted, whatever. In he's so inhibited from restrictions, from things how to do it properly, that he did a sculpture with we were doing like nude torso. He did a sculpture that I still proudly display in our house. Yeah. When when what I created, I accidentally broke it. Accidentally. It was it was impossible to put those two things together. Really? Yes. Oh yes. wow! It and that that was an eye opener for me because his was so raw, so like so you see movement, you see, and I was like trying to, okay, uh, I know anatomy is supposed to be this way, that way, but I never did a sculpture, so I'm a little bit rusty with my hands and like how to do it. He yeah. didn't care. Like for so. That's a, that was an interesting thing. I know exactly what you mean. It is one of those things like, uh, especially looking back at some of the artwork that I did when I was a kid, like I know that I had no idea what I was doing, but looking at it, I'm like going, God, I, I wouldn't be able to recreate that if I tried. But sometimes like looking back on it later on, it uh-huh. seems really cool and abstract when really what it was is me knowing my own abilities looking at it going i just didn't know what i was doing but seeing other people do that it's just like that's fascinating and the person's try and they probably look at it the same way so that's yeah well then here's here's another question then how would you describe your art how would you describe the uh what you create you see uh that's actually very interesting i'm at a very interesting stage in my life like, yeah uh, i had my i had i have three kids so my youngest daughter is 18 years old. So I had her very late. Mm-hmm. And uh, before I had, so I had two boys and my husband in the house, three guys. And whenever I would try to put something, uh, I don't know, like flowers or flo- flo- floating like drapery, they would always say, do you know who lives here? We, <laughs> we guys live here. And I would be always like, Yes, what what I am with my flowers and kind of very given into this, right? Yep. Like okay. And then I was like probably forty or maybe forty five. I wake up on my birthday and I said like pardon my French, I'm like effort. Yeah. I want my flowers and I'll have my flowers. <laughs> I don't care who else lives here. So you know what? 
aging gave me freedom actually okay and that's and slowly slowly i started to move from uh even even uh, uh i did landscapes let's say for longest time but i started to move it less timidly and i started to go like uh, uh just about three years ago at some point i left easel and like precise uh, uh bo- precise canvas right when you know mm-hmm. the composition the ahead of the time you understand it and i took just huge canvas stapled it to the yeah. wall and i just went at it and i didn't know what will be composition i just know i will cut the canvas the way i want at the end so mm-hmm. this non restriction not knowing uh not saying to yourself ahead of the time boundaries or composition because when you have a freedom and you can go you can start with one place it will bring you to certain composition just trusting yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. well I uh, you know, that, that's what i was going to say I, I you just raised a question to uh, to me it's now you created this big canvas and i'm wondering like yeah. a lot of the time mapping out work and, and you're saying you did it freely like are you saying you just put it up and you just start going do you have an image in your head do you have a sketch you're working from or nothing you just go with it i, ne- I never sketch one artwork in my life okay I, I i i i tried but then i get so bored to repeat it on the scene that i will end up doing anything else, something else anyway like okay. i would not i and maybe and even now uh, when you know how really at good school you have to copy they say at least that you have to copy art uh, like masters yeah and sense of composition sense of color i would start doing this but somewhere like one third of the way i get like what i'm doing yeah like you get no, bored no, no. you're like why why I am i doing so this yeah bored <laughs> and like uh, so i would i would just I, I might leave up to that point but then i develop my own thing and um i i just uh, i've been very lucky that i always allowed my intuition to go with this it doesn't mean that i would not sit and try to do detail work mm-hmm. it doesn't mean at all i and i would take hours and i would get inspired with some somebody like uh, with a painting color scheme but so I see inspiration all around me. I'm not dismissing it. I'm not saying that I, like right. I have discovered. It. But when I paint, uh, no matter what I paint, even if it's like just uh, uh, something based on nature or something like more abstract, abstract, I do not have idea of what I will end up. Okay. Even color, I might feel okay. I I, I feel like blue. I feel like something blue, right? Yeah. But it it might end up being more like a, totally not the blue that I imagined at the beginning, right? Yeah. And uh, uh, now also my friends like say like ah. Uh, they said something like mm, yes. You, lately you do your pink work, and I'm like. Pink work. I didn't even notice it. I'm doing pink work, right? <laughs> because I'm doing like I'm doing like everything yep. else. What's, but so apparently, subconsciously, I go through stages of attraction with some conversation with some colors that I have to live through. Yeah. And uh, I always uh, um, bring this uh, anecdote about like some years ago. Uh, when I just started to show my work and I approach a gallerist uh, showing uh, my portfolio as it consisted from different kind of work because if you've been through my website you see that it's mm-hmm. uh, uh, from figurative to abstract yeah and he said to me well this is not right this is art- artistic schizophrenia what I'm doing because I'm all over the place. I'm well at that point I was I was thinking, huh, what does it mean? But you know what? First of all, I I have to admit about myself that failures really hurt. But I every time I kind of what can I do to prove to myself that 
I, I, I can do, I can achieve something. Mm -hmm. And now I started to understand why sometimes it's a failure because of just person doesn't click with you or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the point is that because I was painting so much and almost every day I started to develop just different collections. And so mm -hmm. eventually by the creating of the website, I was able to say, okay, I have 20 works in this direction. And then I have 20 works. You were in able Colorado. to organize them. I was able just to organize, but on a, on a monthly thing, I can go, I can do like two artworks in uh, totally one direction. And then next month, it could be totally different direction or, uh, or how, I can do a collage. How many, how many pieces of artwork do you create on average? It's, it sounds like you're saying you create at least once or twice a month, maybe even more. I'm a rabbit. Oh, I'm really? Rabbit. <laughs> wow. Okay. I, I do yes. see that there's, there is a lot, I mean, you do have a lot of work and I didn't know over how much of a period of time this is. Plus right. it looks like, oh, here's a question I wanted to ask you too. So there's a, and it's because you work in the larger scale. I, I'm almost just as jealous of some of the placements of like you have pictures of your stuff in a setting where it's like on this big, beautiful wall around like all this modern furniture and stuff. Now, are you actually getting those photos there or is this some sort of like a uh, no, photo? This is an app. This is an app. You pay for this app. Okay. That's what I was going to say. I'm like, or is it yeah, an app? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good. I, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. Like, uh, I, it, it, the problem is not the problem that I don't have those spaces to put it on. Right. The problem to carry it, to bring it on. Yes. Because it doesn't fit in the car. I actually, when I, uh, when I sell artwork somewhere locally, uh, I always, uh, because I stretch canvas myself, so I bring it in a roll and then I set up uh, framing and I do it right oh. in the person's place. So, uh, huh. okay. it's huge work I, because I've learned how to do it. And for me, it's a part of, uh, no, that makes total experience. sense. Yeah. Like it, it, you set it up there. That's, Oh my God. Right. That's so much easier to travel. Cause if you're built, okay. Yeah. I never, yeah, I yeah. never and thought of that. It's one of those things where it's like, duh, it's, it makes so much sense. <laughs> even, even if let's say after COVID, like we will be finally exhibiting again. And let's say I go to another city, like somewhere in States or like yeah. New York, whatever. At this point, I will be like sending all my painting in rolls. Mm -hmm. I will be ordering by the time I come, I will be ordering on some local uh, or even Michael's or whatever, like some more local art supply store. I would be ordering proper size of uh, uh, planks. Yeah. And uh, then I will just go to my booth, put it all on the floor and spend like some hours putting, stretching and uh, doing it. And that's, that's the way because it's way too, it's obnoxiously expensive. Right. Just like exactly. To send, to send artwork of that way. Uh, like, uh, yeah, like uh, what you're going to charge, like, uh, like even if, uh, even if I sell to, uh, to another country or whatever, I always explain to people that it's cheaper for them to take it to the local framer mm -hmm. than pay for the shipment. That makes a lot of sense. It's, I can't believe that that never occurred to me. It's so I, I don't have that problem because I don't make large pieces of art or paint. So, but right, it's, it's, right. it's a good thing to have in the back of my head in case somebody is uh, just saying like, Oh, I only sell locally because I can't ship it. And it's like, Oh, you could have it. Pe yeah, no, that makes total sense. Also, you said that you uh, put the stuff in galleries and you actually had sent the, like, how did you promote yourself to galleries or approach people for uh, putting your artwork up or even getting commissions? Like, how do you promote yourself for things like this? Okay. Uh, well, lo locally, uh, I exhibit in uh, uh, in the largest art fair in Toronto. Like, it's Canadian, uh, the biggest Canadian art fair. And uh, it's called the Artist Project. It runs every year in February. And uh, so we there, we just come and hang out stuff uh, like walls provided, lights provided. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's it's very costly. But because I don't do small uh, exhibitions, because of the size of my work, it's difficult for me to participate in outdoor exhibition. Okay. Let's say. 
right? Because uh, I, I drive, but then when wind is going and like my it's my gonna flop over, flopping, <laughs> and everybody else and like the whole community of artists, like then it's the mean effect. Like I had this, and everybody hated me. Suddenly, so much. yours is like an obstacle course, and people are trying to get out of the way. And right, right. Everybody's quitting and running. So I was like, okay, I'm living the search for Elias. And okay. So it's like my outdoor experience. Yeah. So, but there, and uh, so I promote, I put my artwork there. So as I said, it's expensive, but b- considering that I don't participate in the small, which is adds up when you're uh, showing in the small things every time it adds up. Uh, like, so uh, in the you pay gallery. to have it in those galleries is what you're saying. So, no, in this big exhibition I pay. Oh, okay, like, okay, yeah. In big exhibition, that's where I pay. And that's where, like, because it always have galleries, cur- curators, but they see you and then they invite you, if they like your work, they invite you and that's there you don't pay for exhibiting in a gallery. Okay. Then uh, it's commission, uh, I mean, so you split uh, uh, sale sales you just split like usually it's 40 60 or 50 50. okay like, uh, uh, but i find out that i have more i would say success with online galleries yeah I, you're in a virtual online one right now the rave or yes or, okay. right right but it's a mind-boggling because when some years ago i put my work on sachi uh-huh i thought like how would one like ever buy an artwork that you never saw like you don't see textures like it's it, it, for me it's mind-boggling yeah uh no that, that's but, a real thing i've had many discussions with people where that's the same thing they're like you can't you can't understand it you know i can't sell it online because you don't know what you're looking at but okay. but that that's that's making the assumption for the person who's interested in buying it exactly yeah exactly I'll tell you, like, uh, I've been selling from smaller work, relatively smaller, because I don't have small, small, but <laughs> let's say from, yeah, I don't know. Like, Your small work is like most, most people's large work. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's, it's, but th- that's actually uh, an obstacle for me to participate in many art shows because there is always a limit, like, right? They want, like, let's say, 36 by 36, the biggest, mm-hmm. the largest piece, because they want to take money from so many artists and put so many artists like they need to fill up wall with 15 artists yeah right and julia comes and takes part of five not not making sense for them so but um what what i realized that first of all people have an option when you do it with reputable uh online gallery people always have an option when they receive artwork they look at it and they uh, always have like seven days or whatever to say, no, it doesn't work for us or it does. So until it's always this waiting period, but people do have a chance to say yes or no to your artwork. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, that, and that's a solution really. Uh, on top of it, with, with years, especially now, like all online galleries are asking for additional shots, so you can do a very, very up close shot. Oh, definitely, and yeah. Many, many of them are started to ask about video, like right. So you go with a video very close to to the surface, or even if a potential collector says, like, I'm not sure about that side, like right left corner, like can you mm-hmm. bring, show me? So you you do this. So it's actually really I, I love it i for me it's yeah. the best uh because first of all i don't have to slap anything anywhere the only thing i roll my stuff i have a sp- special tubes yeah. i just love the way you said it i don't have to slap anything anywhere <laughs> yeah yeah right like i don't have to set up any displays or whatever right and uh uh i've been uh and you can present it exactly the way you want, you know, exactly. with those with those uh, people saying we want a close up of this or of that or a video of it. It's like, yeah, and that in itself becomes kind of putting your work in a gallery where you go, okay, the lighting has to be just this way so people yes. see it that way. But if they're standing over here, they don't see it that way. And if they're here, it's like, nope, here's the position where you can look at it and you can move this way or you can watch a video of it going closer. You can do anything. And yeah, it's... Exactly. 
if, if anything, it's way more of a perfect art showing <laughs> than any other for, setting. For me, for sure. On top of it, uh, sometimes uh, when people come like to the gallery, right? Yeah. Uh, they could be affected. Okay, they came and they, at the door, they saw artwork that was like, let's say, so mellow and so relaxed and so like in the soft colors yeah. and it made them feel good then they come across my wild like colorful thing and it looks almost tacky for them because it, it just, <laughs> they haven't just... been able to cleanse their palate yet <laughs> right <laughs> yeah exactly yeah uh, exactly so uh you you influence by other uh, external factors hmm. when you show in a gallery Right or somebody stands in front of your work, they, they people didn't see, they passed by. Like anyway, like uh, uh, of course, uh, I'm I'm totally fine to work with galleries. Oh Greek yeah, no, I'm not saying yes, you're going heck with galleries. No, 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 no. no, no. But uh, uh, on top of it, I found better success with collectors overseas and in the United States and in Canada. Yeah. That's very interesting for me. Yeah. Like I'm still like wondering like why the heck it is. Like I have artwork in uh, Belgium, in uh, France, and like, wow. like just name it, right? Yeah. Uh, I can't even tell you how many cities and states, but Canadian, I, I have very little work sold to local uh, Canadian collectors that's very a, little and that's fantastic it's I mean, nothing yeah, wrong with that whatsoever that's i mean yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. the idea <laughs> yeah but, but I, still i have to admit that in a way i'm lucky uh in terms of um, that i was able to kind of do what what i like to do yeah you know, like uh, and not uh, because when you're really on a contract with gallery, it's also another thing because they want to, let's say, your nature series. They don't want an abstract because it's totally different niche of the clientele. So when they cater to you, they, because they're business models, they have to survive. Yeah. When they cater to your work to a certain clientele and then you say, like, I'm bored, I want to paint like this now. They like so it. Uh, I've been very lucky this way that I've been able to to do my, my work, and uh, I'm very humble about it. Like it's uh, seriously. Yeah. And uh, but another thing, like I have an explanation why I'm so uh, fruitile. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because um, uh, painting really. Uh, gives me a subtle different mental state and uh i'm prone to anxiety so I, like i i'm actually on medication from anxieties and okay. like i've been through different stuff uh and painting really calms me down painting really takes it cleanses me it's it's a it's a very healing process for me so if i don't paint on some days uh, it means I will be, it, it will come out in some other way. Right. So that's why I think that my close ones uh, realize, let her paint, let her, let her be with her paint and brushes. And I always come and like, I'm always in paint because then I'm itching and wiping my nose with brush. Like, <laughs> so, like I'm, I'm very messy in this way, but I'm like, now I'm you know, yours. Now I can feed you. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> totally understandable. I get that. <laughs> right, right. oh man and so if people wanted to check out your work again going with the online thing now that we've done this where would you say that they should go okay so at this point uh uh sachi art s-a-a-t-c-h-i okay sachi art okay it's, it's, a, it's actually the biggest online gallery okay gotcha uh then singular art they're based in france and uh, you gallery, okay. I think they're in Los uh, Los Angeles, something on California side. Uh, well, Rave Redwood uh, Art Group, like even after Rave is finished, like they still have their online store. Mm -hmm. That's the one that door. I saw. Yep. Yes, yes. 
and uh, of course my website my own website i'm also on little other ones but uh, just that's too much to <laughs> uh, I think the easiest is to Google. You Google my name, and they all like it. All those galleries will come up. I can I can uh, attest to that. Yes, it is. I, I, I <laughs> when I was doing my research, you were very. It was very easy to find stuff about you, <laughs> which so is a great thing. So, but I want to thank yeah. you so much for talking with me. I'm so happy that I got to well, meet you. Such a pleasure. Me too. <laughs>